So, when we check the voltages of this power supply in part 1, it made a really nasty electrical noise. And I think I know what it is. Because it's been a few days since I recorded part 1. And since then I have used this machine to play some DOS games. And the fan actually spins up when the system gets hot. But before it does, it makes that rather nasty noise. So we have all probably guessed right. But let's check and make sure. Before we do, I'd like to thank our sponsor PCBWay. Aside from making excellent PCBs, they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection molding. Check out their Shad Projects page, where you will find some really cool projects for your vintage PC. Get an instant quote now at PCBWay.com. Thank you PCBWay for supporting this channel. And if your guess is that it's this off-the-market fan controller, you're probably right. So I guess I could put my microphone on top of the controller and then use my rework station to heat up the sensor. And we'll see if it makes that noise when it thinks the system is hot. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, let's hope I don't cook my microphone while we do this. Well, it sort of made a similar noise, but it wasn't as loud as in part 1. We did, however, see that the controller is working, so I'm just gonna leave it like this. And I will keep a close eye on this power supply. I did some thinking last night, and the obvious thing about this project occurred to me. I have other systems with 1.2 meg floppy drives. And this Commodore is much faster than my other 286s. So if I want to have a CD-ROM drive in a 286, this is the perfect machine for it. But before we install a CD-ROM, I still want to have a look at that weird disk controller. So I have connected this freshly tested 1.2 meg floppy drive. And I'm using a standard cable. Let's boot the system and see how it behaves. Well, the drive spins up and seeks. Uh, then we've got a controller failure, of course, because we need to go into the BIOS and change the settings. So, diskette 0, 1.2 meg. Let's try again. And we still get a floppy 1 configuration error. And the drive is set to DS0. Now, let's try the same thing with a regular high-density diskette drive. And we obviously get an error. So let's jump into the settings and change to 1.4 meg drive. And try again. And we still get a disk controller failure. So there's something fishy going on with the controller on this motherboard. And if we take a look at the original drive, it's a Shinon FB357. And when put in this cage, with this added PCB, it changes the model number to FB357i. It's using a straight through cable without a twist. And if we take a look at the manual, Commodore refers to this drive as the Commodore 915 drive. And it also talks about a Commodore 920 drive. And that's a 5 and a quarter inch 360 KB. And on this page here, it refers to a Commodore 910 drive. And that's a 3.5 inch double density drive. And on this page, it also talks about how to set these weird jumpers that's on this tiny PCB. And on Zimmers.net, I also found this note. Using a standard PC floppy cable must send line 6 to line 10. And line 10 to 6. So, for some bloody reason, Commodore changed the pin out on the floppy controller and then reverts it back with this tiny PCB. So, let's try using that weird PCB and straight cable with regular Sony drive and see how it behaves. And we got an error code, so let's jump into the BIOS settings. In here, the diskette drive is correctly set. 
So that's weird. I was expecting this to work. So it wasn't quite that easy, there is something else to this. Well, that is one weird floppy controller for sure. I guess if you have one of these machines and are missing the original drive, you could try that hack that we found on Zimmers.net. But let's press on and install a CD-ROM. And that means we need to install a sound card with an ID controller. And I'm gonna go with an ESS 1686 because we're going to use a sound canvas. So there's no need for a fancy sound blaster. Uh, we could of course also choose an external controller, but since we need a sound card anyways, we might as well use it for the CD-ROM as well. Okay, this is a bit messy, but the CD-ROM is now moved to the sound card and set as master. And the hard drive is the only thing connected to the onboard ID. So let's install that sound card. And this sound card has a really good installer. It just gives you a few choices to make and then you're done. So we're gonna go with 220, IRQ7, DMA1 and 330. Oh come on. Well I have now spent hours trying to install the CD-ROM to the pin headers of the ESS card. But I just can't make it work. And I don't know why. I have used this sound card with a CD-ROM before, without any problems. But for some bloody reason, this just doesn't work. I have tried with another CD-ROM, and I have tried to swap the cable. But I just can't make it work, so let's try something else. The manual does talk about upgrading to CD-ROM, but it doesn't tell how. So, although it's quite unlikely, let's try the onboard ID controller and see if that can handle the CD-ROM. Well, it does funny noises, but let's see if this works. And I have set the jumpers on the CD-ROM to slave. And I have changed the jumpers on the hard drive. And it's now set to master. Let's jump into the BIOS and have a look. And in the BIOS here we can only choose between different hard drives. We don't have the option of a CD-ROM here. So let's try something else. Okay, let's try this. I have now installed an external controller and moved the cable from the CD-ROM, the hard drive and the diskette drive. And I have also disabled the COM port and the parallel port. So let's jump over to the BIOS settings and disable a couple of things. Oh no, we can't disable the controller. Crap. Uh, I guess I'll see if I can find any jumpers that may help us out on the motherboard. And I found a jumper that disables the hard drive, but not the diskette controller. So I have moved the cable to the onboard diskette controller. So let's try this. And unfortunately that didn't work either. But it did try to boot from the hard drive. So I don't think this problem is with the controller. There's some kind of weird compatibility issue. Okay, so I ran into the next problem. It wouldn't boot from the diskette drive. Luckily that controller is documented. So I was able to disable the diskette controller. Let's see if this helps. And it did. And finally some progress. So I decided to try that sound card with different CD-ROMs in other systems. And apparently there is some compatibility issues. For instance, the CD-ROM in this Commodore 486 wouldn't work with a Sound Blaster CT2910. However, the drive that we are planning to use seems to be working fine with this card. So, as you can see here, these are the files on that CD-ROM. So, definitely some compatibility issues running CD-ROMs from sound cards. Now let's move this sound card and this CD-ROM to our Commodore project and see if it will work. Alright, armed with a real sound blaster. Let's flip that switch. Here goes. Drive D optical drive. Holy crap, I think this is working. Finally. And yes, it does. This probably isn't all that many minutes into the video. 
But here in real life, I've been troubleshooting this damn C drone for hours. Okay, so I tried to run a demo, but I'm having some trouble with those RAM cards. Uh, I guess I'll try to clean the connectors and try them again. Alright, so I cleaned the connectors on one of the RAM cards and added some more deoxid. Let's see if we can make this work. And uh, no, that RAM card is gone. Well, I gave the other card the same treatment. Okay, that card is found. So that's a good start. Let's install it and see if it works. Okay, let's try again. Well, that is weird. Now it wants 54 more K. But I just want to see if this works. And it does. That is brilliant. So finally, we have a working CD-ROM. Now the question is, will it run with DOS 4? I don't really know, because right now we're running in DOS 6.2.2 and DOS 4 doesn't run HiMemSys. I tried to find a manual for DOS 4 online, but I couldn't actually find one, which is kind of weird. So I don't really know how to load drivers outside of the 640K, and that could be a problem. I guess we should at least try. Well, that is one well-packed Commodore PC. We only have one 8-bit slot left. Otherwise, it's pretty much filled with stuff. And both RAM cards decided to start work again after a while. So, all that was needed was some deoxid. And a quick note about that hard drive. I found a small sticker at the back here that says HD Type 6. But this drive is a Type 31. So, although it's period correct and the correct size, this is not the original drive. Or this could just be a part of Commodore's confusion at the time. Who knows? Well, I did a complete disassembly and reassembly in part 1, so I skipped ahead here. And we can now move on and install DOS. Okay, let's install bundle DOS 4. And you may have noticed that I haven't put back the badges. And that's because I'm not quite done with the Retrobride process yet. As you can see, it looks pretty damn good. And that diskette drive matches that CD-ROM almost perfectly. But I think it needs one more hour before I can call it finished. So, first we're gonna need to format that drive. Because we already have a DOS 622 installation. Yeah, I think we're gonna jump into FDisk and completely delete that partition. And we're ready for a clean install. And this installer is a bit weird. It requires a scratch diskette. Uh, we're gonna go with option 3, maximum DOS function. Because why not? And uh, we're gonna skip the DOS shell. And I'm obviously skipping ahead quite a bit here, not to bore you. And if you're installing without the DOS shell, DOS 4 fits on just two double density disks. And my main concern here is that DOS 4 doesn't use high mem sys, so I don't know how to load drivers outside of the precious 640k. And needless to say, if you know where I can find a manual for DOS 4, please let me know, or at least the section that describes the memory management. The only thing I could find online was a simplified version, and that didn't show how to manage the memory. So I don't actually know if it's possible to load the drivers outside of the 640k. So this might actually be a mission impossible. For instance, when I tried to play Heart of China, with just the mouse driver installed, there wasn't enough base RAM to play the bloody game. So I had to change to the cute mouse drivers. And that way I could barely play the game. And now with the added drivers for the CD-ROM, I think we're in trouble. And we're done with the installation. Now let's see if we can make that tank mouse work in DOS. So I'm gonna copy the CT mouse exe to our DOS folder. And DOS 4 is old enough to use Edlin. So we're gonna cheat and copy edit.com from a DOS 622 start diskette. Uh, we're gonna put it in the DOS folder too. And we are also going to need a matching QBasic. So, if we reboot the system now, we can now edit the autoexec batch file much easier. So, let's just add a line here, 
c colon backslash dos backslash ct and reboot the system and uh, now the system makes that funny noise so the fan is about to start spinning okay so I'm not sure if we need to do this but I'm gonna disable the onboard com port yeah we have to enable the onboard mouse and I think I'm gonna disable the com port just in case it might interfere with that tank mouse and now we have that onboard mouse but we also got an error, device not found. Crap. Well, I actually found a manual for the Commodore 1352 mouse. And it tells us to use mouse.sys. So let's get back to the autoexec batch file. And rem that line. And instead edit config sys. And in here we are going to add the line device c backslash dos mouse.sys now let's save exit and reboot and apparently we don't have that mouse.sys file so I guess I'll go and grab a copy okay let's copy mouse.sys into our dos folder and try again and we didn't get an error now let's try that mouse in dos hey it works so we're running an Amiga tank mouse in Microsoft DOS. I um, have to say I'm not impressed. <laughs> uh, but let's try it out in a game. Now that could be a problem. I hope I have enough left of those 640k now that we're running mouse.sys. Okay, Heart of China installed. Let's see if we still have enough conventional memory. And we don't. Crap. So just installing the bloody mouse is enough to make this machine useless as it is now. Now this could of course be solved. Uh, we will get back to this later. But for now let's do some speed tests. Well we could do a bunch of benchmarks. And that would give us much better numbers than the original AT. However I'm more interested in how useful that speed is. And to test that, I think Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is the perfect test. So this Commodore has a switchable 286 speed. So if we press Ctrl, Alt and S, that puts the machine in standard mode, running at 6 MHz. And if we press Ctrl, Alt, T, it switches to a turbo mode at 8 MHz. And if we press D, we get double speed. So let's put it into standard mode and start Indiana Jones and hopefully we still have enough conventional memory and we do, awesome yeah but it's lagging quite a bit let's try turbo mode well that's better but it's still very sluggish let's try double speed And yeah, just look at how Indy is flying over the rooftops. Let's run that intro again in double speed. Yeah, it's still not perfect, so I think the 386 system is perfect for this game. But this is definitely playable. And that extra speed boost really makes a difference. Well, we didn't quite reach the happy ending I was hoping for this week because of how much time I had to spend troubleshooting that CD-ROM drive. But I think we did some good progress and this Commodore is now almost a perfect DOS gamer for early CD-ROM games. We now need to figure out if it's possible to load drivers 
for the mouse and CD-ROM outside of the conventional memory. If we can't, we will have to ditch the original DOS 4 and upgrade to a newer version with better memory management. I was also hoping we would install Windows 2.11, as suggested in the manual. But unfortunately it requires a utility diskette that was supposedly included with the system to be able to run in high-res mode. If you have that diskette with the high-res drivers, please send the files my way and we will install period correct windows on this system too. Perhaps I should also mention that the sound cards I tested have a proper IDE, but most of my sound cards have pin headers for non-standard drives. So if you are attempting to use your card as a controller for your CD-ROM drive, you also need to check that your card has standard IDE. Thank you for watching, if you want to support this channel, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and don't forget to ring that bell below.